right, well, once again, good morning and welcome, especially if you're a guest with us today. Thanks for being here. Thanks for taking some time out of your Sunday morning to come and spend some time with us here at Trace. And if you are new here, a couple quick things about who we are. Number one, our mission here is to leave a trace of God's love everywhere we go. But we've learned that along the way of doing that, in the process of doing that, It's impossible to do it if we don't slow down first and actually notice the people that God is putting in front of us. I mean, we all live at a crazy pace, don't we? And in the attempt to keep up with this pace, we're overlooking the people that God is putting in front of us. But he wants to bring those people back into focus because I believe he's putting them in front of us for a reason. What reason is that? So that we can be a trace of his love in their life. I want to read to you an email that was sent to me this last week of how this took place from some people here in our church this past week. Here's how it reads. I wanted to let you know about two of your members who have touched my life beyond belief. Years ago, I met this person, and she rented a room for me. Then I met her husband about a year later. We became friends. She's now like a sister to me. She has seen me through some hard and joyous times. Most recently, some of the hardest of my life. I found myself in the middle of separation, estranged from my biological family, and my father had recently died. I was in the middle of switching jobs, and in a few weeks, I was going to be homeless. I reached out to multiple friends and family. The only people who reached back were, and she mentions the people here at Trace, the only ones. I was truly stunned. These two have shown me such love and compassion at a time when I felt like the world was unfeeling and uncaring. They have been more than friends and more than family to me, and I'm honored to have them in my life. I wanted you to know what kind of people made up your church. They truly live the mission of Trace. I visited before and will be visiting again. Such a mission, such a church has to be one of value for others. Thank you for them. Thank God for them. Sincerely, the person that wrote this email. So can we just celebrate that together? I think that's incredible. That's... <laughs> Guys, last week I preached a message on the importance of carrying one another's burdens. And one of the biggest joys for us as leaders in this church is to step back and actually watch you guys get it. And not just get it, but begin to live it out. Well, today we do... Uh, continue in our faith and fitness series here at Trace. And if you're just joining us, we've gone through several different items for the last couple weeks. We talked about the importance of confession and how it relates to cleanse. We talked about the importance of homeostasis. And you're like, what is that? If you weren't here, go watch the message. Uh, The importance of homeostasis and what it means to carry one another's burdens. And so we're going to continue in this series today. And so I want to begin our conversation like this. How many of you guys, let's crowd participation if you will, how many of you guys actually made New Year's resolutions this year? New Year's resolutions? Okay. How many of you guys already broke your New Year's resolutions this year? That's bad. That's not good. Like you shouldn't, no, I'm just kidding. I'm making you feel even worse now, aren't I? I apologize. How many of you guys have resolved to never make New Year's resolutions again because you keep breaking them? Yeah, that's the majority of us, right? We know that that happens. Well, this is why every year millions of people come back to the table hoping to start again. Let's give it another shot. A blank slate, a clean canvas. And oftentimes we say things like this, this time I'm going to give it what it takes. I'm going to stay the course. This time it's going to be different. But as we know, every year the majority of people don't follow through on these New Year's resolutions. I'm a big fan of this myself. I'm a big fan of New Year's resolutions and goals because I think it helps us to look forward and work on things that will bring value into our life. But as a fitness professional in the past, I observed this behavior so many years that myself and some of my colleagues started to pay attention to what helped some people be successful where others weren't. And after we observed this for several years, we started to see some common threads that led to some people's success. Here's one of them. We learned that if people would actually pursue their goals with one other person, their success increased probably by 50%. And to narrow it down even more, if they were pursuing similar goals, meaning if they were both wanting to lose about the same amount of weight or they were both wanting to train to do a marathon or whatever that may be, if it was similar goals, something naturally happened. 
they would hold each other accountable more and they would encourage one another more, which was typically absent from people that were trying to do these things on their own. And we observed this and it led to a great amount of success, but that even wasn't the number one indicator of success. The number one thing we learned that helped people be successful in their health and fitness goals were specifically writing down or journaling their nutrition. And if they would write down what they were eating, they would learn a whole lot about their routines and habits. And it was so funny because if people wouldn't do this, uh, what it would often happen is I would have somebody to come in and I would be doing nutrition or fit, fitness consulting for them. And it's like, hey, how did you eat this week? And they're like, oh, I did great. I did great this week. Okay, what did you eat on Monday? Oh, Monday, Monday. Yeah, I know I had a salad on Monday and I had a Big Mac from McDonald's. Uh, okay, uh, what about Tuesday? Oh yeah, Tuesday, I remember I ate oatmeal and I went to Krispy Kreme later in the day. I did that too. And it's like, okay, obviously we're not remembering if uh, you're having trouble um, kind of putting together what is good and what's not good. And so if they would just journal and write down what they were eating and what they were doing, it led to the greatest amount of success, which was really interesting to us. Many people have often asked, well, how long do you have to do this, right? How long before you actually put these good habits into place before they become a habit? Because that's what we're trying to do, right? You always hear when it comes to health and fitness of lifestyle changes. That's what we're hoping to do. It's not just a, a quick diet, a quick fix. It's about changing our lifestyle. And so what's the magic number? How long do I have to do this before it becomes a habit in my life? How long before it becomes routine? How long before it becomes a lifestyle change? Now, you may have heard a lot of different numbers, but the most recent number that has come out from psychologists say that it takes an average of 66 days of doing something continuously before it becomes rooted in the brain to the point to where you naturally do it. Therefore, it becomes a habit. Now, check this out because this is very interesting. It has been determined that we make about 35,000 decisions in a day. And 50% of those are done subconsciously. Like when I'm driving my car and I have to slam on the brakes and because I slam on the brakes, all of a sudden, my arm goes out to the passenger side, right? And when I do that and my wife's in the passenger seat, she thinks, oh, that's so sweet. But when, like, Corey or one of my guy friends is in the passenger seat, it's kind of weird. And they look at me funny, right? You've been there. Some of the habits we have in our lives are natural, aren't they? We don't really even have to think about them. We just naturally do them. Psychologists say 50% of our habits come out that way. We don't have to learn them. They just naturally come out of our life. Some of these habits are healthy and they add value to your life. They can add value to the lives of those that are around you. But some of these habits are detrimental and they can cause chaos and destruction in your life. And not just yours, but also to the people around you. And some habits can even take on their own identity. Here's what I mean by that. If you have the bad habit of smoking, then you're known as a smoker. That's an identity statement, but rooted in a habit. If you drink too much alcohol on a continuous basis, then you're known as a alcoholic. That's an identity statement. If you use some kind of substance or if you're addicted to porn or anything else, then you're known as an addict. That's an identity statement. If you're a Dallas Cowboys fan and you're in the habit of losing very important games, then you're known as a loser. That's, a, that's an identity. I love having a microphone sometimes. Guys, habits, whether good or bad, should never define you. I'll be really clear about this, and I'll kind of take a time out and step aside, take a quick detour, because I'm going to get away from my message a little bit. But I need you to hear this. Habits don't define you. You're, you're not a summation of your past mistakes. There's only one person that can define you. It's your heavenly father. Especially if you put your faith in his son, he does have a couple things he'd like to say to you. Some identity statements that he would like to give you. And I'm not even going to read these. I'm just going to ask that they put them up on the screen. And I want you to read these to yourself. Maybe jot down the biblical reference because you might need to go back and revi revisit these because it's very possible that you've been labeled with something along the way. 
Maybe you gave yourself that label. Maybe somebody else labeled you. So take a moment and read these two verses to yourself. catch that? You're not defined by a bad habit. Your heavenly father says that if you'll put your faith in Christ, you're his child. That's your identity. Jesus says if you'll follow him, you're his friend. That's your identity. So let's actually take a moment and look at the definition of habit because it's going to help me to explain this point just a little bit further. Habit is something that you do regularly that is learned. It's learned. It's not innate, meaning it's not inborn. It's not from birth. It's not inerrant in your character. It's not who you are. So stop defining yourself by a bad habit. Let God define you. Time in. Based on that definition, I want us to talk about us for a second. I want us to talk about what this means for us as a church. And you'll learn this about me. I'm a very ambitious person. I love to accomplish things. I love getting a group of people together and finding something that will bring value into our lives and saying, we can do this. Let's go after this together. And there are hundreds of things that I would hope that we would accomplish or, or goals or habits that I would want us to pursue together as a church. But for today, I just want to talk about one. And the reason I just want to talk about one, because I believe if we will all do this one thing together, it will make the biggest difference in your life and in our church. And for our purposes today, I want to call this goal that we're going to pursue together a squad goal. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with this term, and if you're not, here's how it's defined. A squad goal is an inspirational term for what you'd like your group of friends to be or accomplish. And guys, again, I, there are hundreds of things that I hope into the future that we'll want to tackle together, things that we'll want to be together, things that we'll want to accomplish together in the city as we take the love of Jesus Christ into this community, into some of the darkest corners of the world. There are so many things that I would like for us to do together as we move into the future. But for today, I want to focus on one squad goal. One thing that my hope is in our pursuit of doing it together, it becomes routine, a habit in our life to almost where it just naturally takes place. But I've done this long enough to know that not all of us will pursue this with the same tenacity that I hope you would. Not all of us will pursue this with the same amount of resolve. And I've done enough fitness coach, coaching and nutrition coaching and even spiritual coaching in my life that I know that many of us will come to the table with the best of intentions, but really with not the desire of follow through. And I want to make a statement to you that I've made to a lot of people in the past, whether in the health and fitness sphere or in our spiritual lives, and it sounds like this. The best of intentions will get you at this exact same place at the exact same time next year, being the exact same person. In other words, guys, if nothing changes, nothing changes. And I know you're wondering, well, what is it? What is the goal? I'm getting there. I'm getting there. We're going to get there. But I hope that you'll come to the table with as much tenacity and with as much resolve as possible as we get, to get, get together and say, hey, this is a squad goal. We're going to do this together. So here's what we're going to do. First, let's start with that number 66. If it takes 66 days before something becomes a habit, then let's start there because that's a good place to start. But instead of the number 66, I actually want us to focus on the number 70 and give me a moment and I'll tell you why. On February 3rd, we're gonna start this squad goal together. So that gives you two weeks between now and February 5th to find somebody to do this with you because we've already determined that if somebody does this with you, there's more accountability and encouragement, which leads to a much greater percentage of success. So you got a couple weeks to find somebody to do this with you. So we're going to start on February 5th, and then we're going to end on April 16th, which is Easter Sunday. Here's what it is. And if they'll throw up the slide of the D1. For those of you that don't know, 
This is one of our main focuses here at Trace. It's called D1, and D1 stands for Disciple One, meaning if you're not discipling anybody else, if you're not helping anyone else learn and grow in their faith in Christ, make sure you're at least taking care of yourself. You're discipling yourself. And so the way that this looks is we want you to do this, and we believe this is actually a very, very simple but effective tool of learning to hear from God and study his word. And so the D1 Bible study looks like this. Number one, just start with one chapter. And this, honestly, will only take you about 10, 10 to 15 minutes a day. Start with one chapter, just one chapter. You'll re- read one chapter, and then after you read that chapter, you're going to write down a verse. What was the verse in that chapter that stood out to you the most? Maybe it's a question about something in that chapter that you didn't understand, and so you'll write that down. Did I, you remember me telling you that the people who wrote things down were the most successful? And then I want you to write down your thought. What is it, your, what's your thought on that particular verse? Why did that stand out to you? Is there something that God is specifically trying to say to you? And then take a moment. This may be the most important part of this, where after you read and you're letting it absorb, you just take a moment, you step back away from it. And you just, God, is there anything that I'm missing? Is there anything that you want to tell me about what I just read? Is there anything you're trying to get my attention on that I might be overlooking? And then we want you to tell it to one person. And by telling it to one person, you actually start to retain the things that you're learning. Now, let's have a moment of reality. Because some of you guys, unfortunately, are already thinking, of course the pastor wants us to read the Bible. I can't believe that's the squad goal, right? I only picked one thing. I could have picked anything. But I'm picking the one thing that I, bring, I believe will bring the most value to your life and to the life of this church. This was not a flippant decision. I believe that if we will all come together around this particular squad goal, that not only will it begin to transform your life, but it will transform the lives of those around you. Throw that slide back up really quick, please. At the bottom, you see that we give you a suggestion of where to start. And we put, I don't know if you can read it, James, John, Acts, and Romans. We start in the book of James. We tell people to start there because it's the most practical book in the Bible, if you ask me. Great place to start for those that have never done this before. Then we want you to go to John. John's one of the gospels. If you ask me, it aligns Jesus and God together as one more than any other gospel. So we believe that's a very important gospel. Then the book of Acts, that's how the church got started and what the church is supposed to look like. We believe you should know that. And then the book of Romans, many would call the book of Romans the book of salvation. It tells you how you can be saved and enter into eternal life with your heavenly father. Very important stuff. Now, anybody want to guess how many chapters are in those four books? Seventy. I honestly did not know that until I was putting this together, and it was one of those things where I just felt God affirming, yeah, this is the number one squad goal you guys need to be pursuing together as a church between February 5th and Easter. Friends, there's a lot of things that we can teach you, but we're not God, and I'm not the Holy Spirit. And so I want you to get into God's word. I want you to hear from him. I want you to be comforted by him. I want him to teach you. I want you to to understand what it means to be in his presence. I want you to understand how he wants you to navigate pain and hardship in your life and the foundation he wants you to build on his son Jesus. I want you to understand all that stuff. Here's what 2 Timothy says. There's nothing like the written word of God for showing you the way to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Every part of scripture is God-breathed and useful one way or another, showing us truth, exposing our rebellion, Correcting our mistakes, yeah. training us to live in God's way. Through the word, we are put together and shaped up for the tasks God has for us. He has purposes for our life. He has purposes for this church. And we have to engage his word to hear from him. So squad goal number one, and what we're going to accomplish and tackle together this year is to do D1 Bible study every day for 70 days. And we want everyone to do the same list that we have at the bottom. Even if you're in a different Bible study right now, just do this with us. And we'll remind you again, we're going to start here in a couple weeks. So find somebody to do this with you so that you can be encouraged and held accountable in getting into God's word. But James, John, Acts, 
and Romans. Let's get into God's word together and see what happens. Now, I want to talk to you really quick about something that is very, very interesting in the health and wellness field. And it's something called the set point theory. And the set point theory is this. If you create enough consistency, if you do something consistently over a long period of time, your body actually gets trained to work for you. Here's what I mean by that. If you eat 1,500 calories every single day, for they say the this, this set point takes place around six months to two years. So for every day, if you will eat around 1,500 calories, and I'm just using that as a generic example, 1,500 calories every single day. And then one day, you decide to eat 3,000 calories. Your brain is so used to 1,500 calories that it will raise its own metabolism to get rid of that excess 1,500 calories because it's been trained to live off 1,500. Meaning being consistent over a long period of time actually starts to work in your favor. God's word is like a set point for us. And if you'll be consistent in this, if this will become a habit in your life, it takes 66 days, we're going to go for 70. But if this will become a habit in your life, here's what you're going to start noticing. When that unforeseen obstacle, challenge, unfortunate event comes at you that you didn't expect, kind of a shock to the system, almost like eating 3,000 calories compared to 1,500 God's word is what helps keep your path straight. He actually says this in Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. He says, trust in me with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. That's what everybody else is doing. You see how that's working for them. But acknowledge me. Acknowledge me in all your ways. And I will set your paths straight. Ultimately, guys, this squad goal will help us to take on a new shape but not the kind of shape like losing 15 pounds or buns of steel. That's not what I'm talking about. The shape I'm talking about has to do with clothing ourselves, clothing ourselves in Christ. This is what Paul is referring to in Romans chapter 13, verse 14. But ultimately what he's saying, if I were to put it in practical terms, is this. We need to look to Jesus more. We need to listen to Jesus more. And we need to love like Jesus more. Far too often, guys, we try to find our purpose and fulfillment outside of Christ. And then we wonder why we land where we land. Let me tell you one more reason why I think this should be the most important thing that we do. As a pastor, it's not uncommon for me to have somebody come into my office and say, where's God? Where was God when I lost my job? Where was God when my mom died? Where was God when everything was falling apart from underneath me? Where is God in my life? And oftentimes I just would respond with empathy, but also ask some questions. I say, well, how often do you feel like you spend time with God? How often do you pray? How often do you get into his word? And most of the time, the answer is not very often. And I look at him and say, listen, I'm not saying this to make you feel guilty. I'm just trying to help you to process through this in a healthy way. What if God is up there looking down with his arms up saying, yeah, where am I? Where, where am I in your life? Where, where are you spending any time with me? You wonder why I'm feeling distant? I'm right here, but you're separating yourself from me. You're not spending any time through prayer and in my word. I'm trying to help you to straighten your path when it gets crooked, when you get derailed. But where am I in your life where I can even have the opportunity to do this? Let me be really clear about something. Guys, this is not so much about behavior improvement or even self-improvement like what we'll find in a lot of our New Year's resolutions. This is more about self-denial. This is more about us backing up and saying, you know what, I know this, it's not about me. God didn't create me so that I could just do whatever I wanted to do. He created me for his glory. He created me for a purpose, and he does have a purpose for me. And can I remind you of the words of John 10, John 10, 10 when Jesus said, Listen, I came to give you life, and not just any kind of life. Life to its fullest potential. But first, you've got to give me your life. It's about self-denial. Friends, as your pastor, I want you to experience this fullest 
type of life. And it begins with looking to Jesus more, listening to Jesus more, and loving like Jesus more. And if you're asking yourself the question, well, how, how do I do that? Just follow through on squad goal number one. And if you'll follow through on squad goal number one, God is going to teach you what it looks like to look to him more, listen to him more, and love like him more. Let me close by talking to you about another type of habit. It's a very interesting type of habit. It's called a keystone habit. And a keystone habit is a habit that builds on itself, meaning that habit alone will create many more uh, good habits, potentially bad as well, but it, a keystone habit builds on itself. In the health and wellness field, writing and journaling your nutrition would be a keystone habit because when you write those things down, you start to learn what you're eating and how that food makes you feel and start to hone in your serving sizes to what your body needs and not just what you want. That's a keystone habit. I would argue the most important keystone habit that we make in our faith is daily surrendering to God. Remember, this is not about self-improvement. It's about self-denial. In Luke 9, 23, Jesus looks at his followers. He says, listen, if you really want to follow me, like if you're really taking this serious, if it's not just about coming to church on Sunday so you can check a box and feel good about yourself, if you're really wanting to take this serious and be my disciple, my follower, here's what I want you to do. I want you to deny yourself. Pick up your own cross and follow me daily. It's a daily surrender to God. But even that starts with one decision. Because before you daily surrender to God, you first have to surrender your life to God for the first time. And some of you in here actually still need to make that decision. But when we hear that word surrender, it doesn't sound like a, a word of strength, does it? Especially for men, it's like surrender. I'm not going to surrender anything. Surrender is only for the weak, the fragile, and the French. That's bad. The opposite is actually true. Surrendering your life to Christ is the strongest decision that you'll ever make. It's a keystone habit. It's a decision that will build on itself. Some of you in here need to make that decision. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to transition into a time of response right now. And in this time of response, we're going to do what we do every week here. And we're going to participate in communion. And communion is for those that have put their faith in Christ already, where we take a piece of bread, I think we have crackers, and it represents the body of Christ, and we dip it in a cup that represents his blood, and we remember that he gave his life so that you could have it to the fullest. But you have to trust him with your life. You have to surrender it over to him. But for some of you, this is going to be an even bigger step. Today we're going to be doing some baptisms. We have two, maybe three people lined up. We had three people that were going to be baptized. I think one of them's sick and not going to make it. But we're already ready to go down and we're going to celebrate these decisions together. And maybe some of you have never made this decision. It's possible you've put your faith in Jesus before in the past, but for whatever reason, you just never followed through on baptism. That is your next step. Jesus makes it crystal clear. Maybe you were baptized as a baby, and if you were, then that's awesome. I think it's incredible that your parents did that for you. But the Bible consistently teaches us that this is a decision that we need to make for ourselves, that we need to publicly accept and confirm that, yes, my faith is in Christ, and I'm not ashamed to let everybody else know it. And if that's you and you want to take that step today, we've got clothes for you. We'll give you some shorts. We'll give you a cool I Am A Trace shirt. And when you walk down here, all we want you to do is pick up one of these towels that you see on either side of the stage and then just make your way out to the lobby. And Corey and some of those guys will be out there to talk to you. Listen to me. It all begins with Jesus. It all begins with Jesus. It is the keystone habit that will pay the most dividends in your life as that decision alone will build on itself causing a transformation in your life that you could never imagine. I promise you, I'm a living testimony of that. So if that's you, whether you're putting your faith in Christ for the first time or maybe it's, it's you, you know, your situation was you put your faith in Christ a while ago, but now you're following through on baptism, we wanna celebrate that with you today. Just come down and grab a towel. 
So I'm gonna pray for us. But before I do, can I have you stand? And after I'm done praying, I'll let you guys come down. And this is also a time, I forgot to mention this, that you can bring your tithes and offerings if you've been prepared to do that. If you're a guest with us, don't feel any obligation. Uh, But you should know that one of our hopes here at Trace is to become the most generous church anybody's ever experienced. And so if you want to partner with us in that generosity, we would love for you to do that. And so there's buckets down here that you can bring your offering. I want to read a passage of scripture from Isaiah over you. And then I'm going to pray and then I'll ask you to respond from that point. But do me a favor, just will you close your eyes for me? I just want you to hear from your heavenly father. Don't be afraid. I've redeemed you. I've called your name, your mind. When you're in over your head, I'll be there with you. When you're in rough waters, you will not go down. When you're between a rock and a hard place, it won't be a dead end because I am God, your personal God, the Holy of Israel, your Savior. I paid a huge price for you. All of Egypt with rich Cush and Seba thrown in. That's how much you mean to me. That's how much I love you. I'd sell the whole world to get you back. Trade the creation just for you. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful for all the people that you've brought in the direction of Trace Church. But God, I know you're not interested, and I'm not interested in people coming in here and hearing a sermon and then going out and living as if nothing changes. And It's not about self-improvement, God. We know that. It's about self-denial. It's not about behavior management. It's about daily surrender. So Father, I pray that for anyone in this room that needs to make that decision to put their faith in you, maybe for the first time or follow through on being obedient in baptism, God, that you'll give them courage in this moment. It's where it starts. It all starts with your son, Jesus. And God, as we try to tackle this squad goal together of being invested in your word every day for 70 days, I have no doubt is the best thing that we can do as a church to bring fruit into our life and love into not our, just our lives, but those around us. And so God, would you give us a deep sense of resolve and resilience to follow through and not just have the best of intentions. I believe it'll transform this church. So, Father, I put these guys in your hands, and I pray your spirit is moving in and among them right now. And for those that need courage, that you'll give it to them. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You guys are welcome to respond.